passing of my sister, um, I would always remember the, the kind words of comfort that people sent to me in this very difficult time. And I want to sincerely thank all of those who, who have done so and who have been to the wake or the funeral or have helped in whatever form. We have had the local government elections and the results are out by now. And most people have been in the process of forming their opinion as to what took place in these elections. They have seen the traditional slot from GCOM and they have seen websites managed by GCOM give information that is not factually accurate. They have seen the spin in the media um, and some are clear about what took place in these elections and others are not so clear because of the different sources of information and because of the spin surrounding what took place at the elections. So let me say right at the beginning that when we said the PPP won these elections massively, it was not a loose claim. It was not a, an irresponsible claim. But when I made that statement, I said, it is too early to speak comprehensively on the issue. When the numbers become clearer and the official declarations are made, you will hear from us further. And I think today we have had enough information out officially to talk about those claims that we made and whether they were accurate or not. Because there's been a lot of spin, particularly in some of the newspapers, about what took place in the city, Georgetown, Bartica, in, in the municipalities. But let's look at the results overall. The first thing I've seen is that the PPP in a statement said, we've won 48 of the 71 local government elections contested seven others were tied. I've now seen that figure reflected as 43. That is inaccurate. We, we hope that it is corrected shortly. From the information I got from Freedom House up to this morning, it, the number is 48 and remains at 48. What did not happen is that many areas where there was a no contest, like Crabwood Creek or Blackbush Polder or Kintyre Burlam, those were not included in the results, but they were part of the elections. It's just that APNU could not field candidates there. So we won those areas even before the election started. So they have to be included as part of the results. I've seen wrong numbers. That I was told that there are wrong numbers for Pomona Good Hope. Um, that the Lagrange means local government elections were wrongly declared. These should account for the difference. But I do hope that GCOM will move swiftly to correct these inaccuracies and the newspapers that have been reporting them would rep report what exactly took place at the elections. That's, that's the first point that I wish to, to make. So the PPP won 48 of 
the 71 areas contested um, and tied seven others. APNU, by contrast, won 15 of those areas. The PBP won more than three times of the areas contested, the local government elections, than APNU did. The second point is there were 1,166 1, seats contested. The PPP won, based on the figures that I've received this morning, 754 of those seats. APNU won 375, and the independent groups, 36. So it means that PPP won 65% of the seats contested in, across the country, APNU 32%, and the others about 3% of the seats contested. I'm giving you this to ensure that you have an idea about, so you can draw your conclusions yourself about what we are talking about, this massive victory. Now based on GCOM's number, we won 25 thousand votes, we got 25,000 votes more than APNU. Our numbers are closer to 28,000. And this is, does not include, does not include the four municipality, the four NDCs where there was a no contest. So take for Crabwood Creek, Blackbush Polar, Barlam, Kintyre, but Woodley Park. If you take 50% of the votes that we got in 2015, and you put it in the, the PPP column, we would be talking about something like 33,000 votes more than APNU. But as it stands now, leaving out those areas, even leaving them out, we won 28,000 more votes than APNU in these elections. The national elections, the difference was less than 5,000 votes. And what makes this particularly interesting is a difference of 28,000 votes when the turnout was under 50%. This, this magnifies basically the, the showing of the PPP. Because with only a 50% national turnout, 47% turnout, we won 25,000 votes more than APNU. 25,000 by, by GCOM's number so far, but we, if they add in some of the other things, we'll go up to our numbers show 28,000. But so, so we, with just a 47% turnout, this is a massive victory for the PPP. It means that 28,000 more people showed up at the polls and voted for us than they did for, for APNU. And so if you look at these three things, the first one is the popular vote a massive victory for the PPP. The number of NDCs won a massive victory for the PPP, 48%, 48 of them. And thirdly, the number of seats contested, again, a massive victory for the PPP on all three counts, on all three counts. Now, in areas that APNU did well, take for example, the city, and New Amsterdam, some of the other areas, the turnout was below the national average. The turnout was less than 40% in those areas when the national average was 47%. So even in APNU strongholds, the turnout was low. 
If you look at, I'm not going to go into many more details because I think those three things have made our case alone. And no, no amount of spin can take that away from the PPP, that this was a huge victory for, for the PPP. Now, there are a couple of other things I want to talk about, because now that we have had the observers report the elections as free and fair, I'm hoping that, that somehow that we, we would have the observers now and in the future commit to signing the UN protocol for observing elections where you have to, first of all, assess the, the period in the pre-election pre period, the state of readiness of GCOM, election day activities, post-election day activities, and then when the declaration is made, the reports will, that come out from the observer group will reflect the entire process. For it to be free and fair, it, you cannot talk only about election day activity. And anyone who says otherwise, including these, some of these observers, clearly do not know what they are talking about. Fair, fairness, it's, it's, it starts, the fairness issue starts long before elections. So, so let us examine a few things that happened in these elections that we, we hope that will find their way into the observers' reports. First of all, they move to, to declare the haste at which the government declared some of these areas townships, Bartika, uh, Letem, Mabaruma. These were made into municipalities. Now, we had a plan for years now, if you look at the project that we had with the CDB 10 years ago, we talk about developing townships across Guyana. Rosignol, Bartika, Parika, many other areas. But the reason we did not move swiftly to implement those, although that project that we started working on it, on, on townships with, was maybe um, launched somewhere in 2004, is the reason we did not do that is because we recognized that several things had to be in place before you move several of these areas into township status. And that you had to go through a process to, to, to do this. So take, for example, Bartika. I went to Dog Point, an Amerindian community, and I, I asked, in fact, they told me, we were never consulted as to whether we want to be part of this township. But they are now part of the township. Then they told me that some people came and started measuring their properties. This was even before the elections. These Amerindian communities have about five, eight acres of land, maybe a little bit more, in, in the Dog Point area. And they were told that they will now ha get only a 50 by 100 because they live in the, in the town. And even if that doesn't happen, if they have to start paying rates and taxes because they live now in the township, they would probably lose those properties. They may not be able to pay based on the size of the properties. But the Amerindians, in the, we've recognized for a very long time, the people who live in those areas, that they should have security of tenure over their land. So I want to know now 
what all those champions of indigenous people's rights are saying. Will the, the British High Commission and the American um, Embassy and the others talk about the, the lack of consultation with Amerindian communities that could put the secure the, their land issue in jeopardy uh, as a leading up to the elections because it was part of this electoral cycle and would the local NGOs also speak about this under the PPP there was this everyone used to talk about it APA and all the others Sydney Alicock etc about the free prior informed consent FPIC they call it did they get FPIC from those Amerindians who were living in those areas that are now included in the municipalities before they launched those areas. Secondly, I saw Raphael Trotman going to Four Miles and talking about having a meeting, no doubt with some APNU supporters, and they said 80% of the people there are non-Amerindians. I went to four, four Miles just recently too. The bulk of the people who are there are Amerindians. They got their land title processed under the PPP. Now, this group of APNU supporters, no doubt instigated by some of these ministers, these ministerial visits, are now questioning the people's right to their title in that community. But we have seen this happening even along the coast, where Basil Williams have gone to some communities in Region 2 and Region 5, and the result of it was the people's land titles, etc., their transport is being challenged. Their leases are being challenged. But coming back to the point, there was no consultation. I went to Hosororo, Barabina, those places are now part of a tongue, and now suddenly they they have, not, um, they have not been consulted. I hope that the observers will put that in their report. The second thing is this. We have always recognized that incumbency has a, an advantage. That government, if, if they travel, etc., around election times or use the state media, they can get an advantage. And, and that, I believe, is pretty normal in a society. What we are opposed to is this flagrant violation, this flagrant abuse. In Mabaruma, the week before I went in, seven ministers flew in with huge entourages using state resources. First lady went twice, the president once, then another five ministers flew in in, in these areas. Is the same thing happened in Bartica. 13 ministers went in there, different trips over and over, using state resources, but um, Letem was the same thing. In those hinterland communities, I, I estimate from what I've heard that fifth, easily they would have spent about $50 million of state resources to campaign in those areas in the hinterland at least 50 million and this is why when we questioned at budget time the large sums of money that were going into some ministries social cohesion etc they were very delinquent in giving us answers very vague so are we going to see uh, in the report of the observers report question about this flagrant violation of state resources, the abuse, not just a normal use, because as I said before, there is, if the president travels, nobody bothers with that too much, even if he campaigns. But here you have 13 ministers and seven ministers and all of them flying in. Just two weeks before the elections, they had not gone there, the people told me, in the eight, seven, eight months they had been in office, but in the two weeks, we've heard about the handing out of vouchers in Bartica. I've asked for a couple of co the copies of the vouchers. 
handing out of vouchers a week before the elections. One week, in the same week of the elections. So that's the next thing. We have heard on the campaign people saying, don't vote for this group because they're not going, if they win, we're in power now. They're not going to get any resources. Now, this is threatening the electorate that if they freely exercise their, their franchise, that they choose a group that they think can best represent their community, that they will, if they choose the wrong group, that is a group not sympathetic to APNU or not APNU AFC, they will be starved of resources coming from ministers. Now, will we see that in the observer reports? Though? And then this whole issue about electronic voting. I've seen the private sector commission said that this will support electronic tabulation. But the tabulation does not solve the problem. The problem in the last elections took place because of partisan presiding officers. We have not resolved this issue about a transparent process for hiring presiding officers and election day officials. And that is why the only way that you can avoid that, any, the capricious action of partisan presiding officers and returning officers, etc., is to ensure that their role is minimized in the electoral process and, and in the polling stations. And electronic voting and tabulation, a, a, a system, dual system for electronic voting that is electronic with a paper trail, so it could be audited, and then electronic tabulation will help to do that. That's the only way that you can address this issue comprehensively. Because if the stealing takes place before the tabulation is done, even if you're tabulating electronically, then you're tabulating flawed results. You have to address the problem of, of stealing. And so we hope, I mentioned the observer groups, that they are not going to report just on polling day activities, that they undertook the task of being observers. And observers have to do much more than just talk about polling day activities. These are just some of the issues I wanted to um, talk about. I'm not going to go on much longer. I wish to to thank all of the PPP supporters, the volunteers, the many people who worked across the country um, to get this victory. It was a huge victory for the PPP. It, it reinforced the fact that we have done well in our tenure. It, it, it was the low turnout in many APNU areas is a sign that people are very unhappy with this, this concept of the good life that a few people seem to enjoy. And because, they, as I said before, the government still lives in this make-believe world, this cocoon that everyone is doing well. I've gone across the Esekubo coast, seen the suffering in many communities, in PPP communities as well as APNU communities. Ordinary people are, are hurting in many, many areas. Many, many areas. People in the city too. And that's why I think that after the big enthusiasm of the 2015 elections, the turnout was so low in the city too because people were concern about this. I saw someone in the first Stabrook Art News article where they spoke about how much this government has done in such a short period. You know, they have done Mandela Avenue, cleaned it up and cleaned up the city a bit. And I must confess it's, it's true and the government should get credit for it. But it seems, what seems to be lost on many people is how it's been done. 
and there is no, absolutely no transparency. It's as though you can spend money anyhow once it's not spent by the PPP and once it's you like the outcome. So the 800 million that have been spent in the city, we have not seen a single, a single public advertisement for any of those contracts. So it's okay though. And secondly, the huge write-offs that were given on, on taxes. We don't know who got these write-off, how it was done. There is no transparency about that, but that's okay too. And it it's just boils down to two different philosophies. When the PPP had to fix the city, you couldn't drive around the city. So we embarked on a project, not to say that the city had to do it, about 25 million US we spent on building roads in Camberville, in Kitty, rebuilding Main Street, rebuilding Cherry Street, rebuilding Rob Street, Norton Street, uh, Cherry Street, roads that were impassable. But we fixed those. We put in the street lights, we bought pumps to the city, we built a new dump site. The landscape of the city has changed under the PPP. The number of buildings that have gone up, the economic activities in the city, the number of vehicles, traffic jams, etc. That is what we're about. It is about progress. It is about economic activities. It's about jobs. The call centers that are going up here now that would hire a couple thousand people just down the road that was built under the PPP. That is what we're about. The App News concept is about building more monuments in the city. Every week it's about a monument, clean, cleaning up some areas on Mandela Avenue, and with, with a question, we don't know, not the, the back row there, we don't even know how they're raising the money. Can any member of the media tell us who is raising the money and where it's going to? which account it's going to, but we don't know that, but that's fine. They get credit for cleaning some canals, and they should get credit for that, and building monuments. That's, that's what the credit is for. Under the PBP, it was expansion, expansion. Now in this city, the real estate market is dead. You call any real estate agent, it's dead. People are not going to are building, etc. Now, it's two different philosophies of development. And so my, my fear is that we may very well have a clean city, but largely, but no economic or very little economic activities in the city. Very little economic activities. But that's a different matter. I do not think we competed effectively in the city, in Linden, and in some other areas, in New Amsterdam. We will, we will change that. The PPP will hit the ground in Linden, in New Amsterdam, in Georgetown. We will go to all the communities because even APNU supporters and explain to them why we have a better plan for change, developing this country. I've said it before, from tomorrow, our work is, in fact, it has started already. We're now looking past local government elections. These Areas were one, our councillors must act in a manner that, that they are respectful of people, serve their best interests, that's an instruction we are giving to our councillors. But at the national level, we are focusing on the party, bringing in more young people, more women. We will work in, in our base, in our strongholds, to strengthen the party. And we will work in up new strongholds too, to convince people there that the PPP has the best interests of all of Guyana um, at heart. And so the work starts in those areas. I must confess we did not compete effectively in these areas. Our campaign was lackluster in many of the areas, the municipal areas, um, and we, we have to change a lot of that. Thank you very much. Yes, sure.
Um, you spoke about your estimation, 50 million in safe resources used for trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard about the flights and all of that, but I just wanted to get a better understanding of your assessment. If you could point me to some more facts so that I can see how you're right. Yeah, sure. They, what, what they look at, the guys did that estimation for me, the number of ministers, the cost for flights, the cost for flights alone with the number of trips made into the interior. A, a normal charter would be like about close to a million dollars. So based on the charters and the large entourages that went in and stuff like that, that that's how they e estimate. It could very well be an underestimate. Um, <laughs> it could very well be underestimated. But, but somebody needs to look into this. That's what I'm asking. Yes, please. Um, off of the general yeah. um, I have not been very fully um, apprised of the other issues, but yes. Please, please go. If if there is any issue that I am not familiar with, I, I will tell you. Go ahead. Um, but you are you clear on local? Let's finish the local government elections issue first. We have clar clarity. I notice the government is very silent on this issue. Nor like in whim. Uh, Nagamoto, uh, uh, he was there all day trying to run people up to go. I think he even went into one of the polling stations unauthorizedly, but he, he got wiped out. His family contested there. He got wiped out in, in Wim. Uh, it's a pity they didn't contest in places like Blackbush Pole and Crabwood Creek and the other areas too. And um, even in, in Potentia, we had not won that NDC, I think, ever, or since 1970s. They, we won, the, won that ND, um, the NDC. I suspect a lot has to do with Wales, the heartless position, the unconscionable position of this government on, uh, on the Wales, the closure of the Wales sugar estate that it will affect everyone, APNU supporters as well as PPP supporters, Guyanese, it will affect them. And uh, this is, uh, I hope that maybe this would lead them to rethink some of their strategies on the ground, that where they think that they are doing extremely well, but that policy, it's not just the policy of closure, but they have nothing else to offer to people as an alternative and secondly, secondly, the manner, the callous, uncaring manner in which it was done. It was sprung on the people overnight, contrary to the, their own commission of inquiry report that they now distance themselves from. So this is absolutely important. I've noticed that we don't have the traditional you know, jubilation from the government um, about because no doubt they have assessed the results themselves and they have seen that close to 30,000 people voted more, more against them than, than they had. Yeah. If we're done with local government issues, yeah. Um, the nature of the elections is that the results are declared at the local level. But GCOM has an obligation. They can't just pass it off to people to do much more. And even a meeting with the entire media community, you know, just to explain how they're going to post the results and explain the results would have helped a lot in clarifying many of the issues, etc. So I do think 
that there is a bigger role for GCOM. The, the deficiencies in GCOM, we seem to be sweeping them all under the carpet every, every single time. And based on this, this almost arrogant way of, oh, we did it. We just hired a new PR person. Our little person has been there for one month only, and we had it right. It's almost like th that they don't understand what we're talking about is the system. The system must work in a way where people have confidence in the system, not necessarily individuals, and that it's objective and it's user-friendly and that it is helpful to all of our citizens. And that we don't have now. So I, I do agree they should have done more, but I think the laws require not the headquarters to declare, but the declarations have to be made at the local local level. Yeah. Yes. Anything else? Okay. All right. Yes. Well, go on. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this, the regulation, the regulation issue. Yeah, sure. Now, government has taken a line that most licenses should be reported. In light of your strong advocacy uh, moment ago for transparency, uh, how would you respond to the government? Well, they two are not connected. Absolutely not. So the government can do what it wants. Um, if it wishes to revoke the license, it, that's, that's the government's decision. But then that's a, that would be a legal matter. I'm sure people will go to the court. And so that's the government's position. I didn't know that this government needed any any approbation or approval from the PPP to do a anything excepting when they want to commit corrupt acts. Like first, uh, you know, like the hospital, it was, we're not going to go with it, it's corrupt. And then when we found out that they are giving it to a person who was very close or a group that's very close to Ramjatan, a note public tender, they suddenly fell in love with the PPP evaluation report. That the PPP had evaluated this bidder and ranked him second rank. And so since the first rank bidder, we have him in court now, we have to go with the second rank bidder. And they, then they lied about it too. There is no evaluation report. In fact, the evaluation report disqualify this company. So they needed, they were, they loved the PPP evaluation, misrepresented it when they wanted to commit something in a corrupt fashion. When they want to do other things, um, we, they, don't, they don't focus on that. Take for example, the procurement of drugs and fertilizer and stuff recently. So we had pre-qualified several people. You put out a notice every two years or three years to pre-qualify. It's a competitive process. So Lloyd Singh, Ramru, all of the others apply. You have some criteria, WHO rules, and you assess each company based on the criteria, capacity. Are the drugs registered? Do they have bond, etc. And then, on the basis of that, you then only those people can then submit tenders subsequently because they've been pre-qualified. They keep saying we have single source from Ramru, not because he was pre-qualified, single source. But what's happening now? Check what, where the single sourcing is taking place from people who have not even registered their drugs, not registered their drugs. And secondly, from a man who brought in soap into this country and changed the label on the soap, went to the court, the judge ordered him to remove all the labels. He went to the wharf and sat down and removed all the labels, put locks on it. The same person who 
supply milk to the government and put a French company that has supplied it, and there is no such French company in existence. The same co com company that we heard is, is um, a, a, it's a political investment that he made into the AFC. They're negotiating a power purchase. Killed a miler, and a miler was 10 cents per kilowatt hour we are buying power, and talk about buying power now at 14 cents per kilowatt hour, and, and it, even before the IDB has completed the energy mix study. A lot of these things, when we talk about transparency, at least I made it clear. The other committee that was set up that recommended it to me as Minister of Information, the committee recommended. You had balance, I believe, regional balance, ethnic balance in this because about of the 10 licenses, I think six went to non, non indo guyanese I ensure ethnic balance across the country, geographic balance. I had some criteria. What is the criteria they're using now to buy fertilizer? Where you have a company in New York, a man who is, has a Chinese restaurant, and, and Kaicho Yus used to talk about Fit Motilal. Remember, Fit Motilal was selling some, I don't know what, um, religious supplies in New York. Well, here now, you have a guy who has a Chinese restaurant, supplies Chinese food, etc. Some of the top officials of the government frequent that restaurant. I gather they were by his home in the pre election period. He has won a contract now for $420 million to supply fertilizer. This is not drug specialized. This is fertilizer. Anybody could supply the fertilizer. It's not like people can die from it. It's a fertilizer. And single source. Single source. So at least I had some criteria. I used ethnic balance, geographic balance. Those were my criteria. And I stepped fit, I kept those crit the criteria. In terms of the one with Ramru, you would recall that when he bought the station from Vera, because he did not get a license for any of the media houses from the government, because he set up his newspaper independently. Secondly, he bought the, the television license from Vera, we bought the TV station, from Vera who is a member of ACNU, and Vera had filed a court case for a radio license. And the court ruled, he was the court ruled that we had to consider that license. That was a court case. That was the only license that the court ruled that we had to consider. So, when they talk about friends, but the balance, nobody talks about there are five other persons who are non-Indians. I see them mentioning all the time, only Anand Prasad and, and um, Bobby Ramroo. What about the five other persons who are non-Indians who got licenses for radio across Guyana too? So I, I can justify lots of the things. I see now they've started about land issues, okay, sure. The land issue you want to come to, and I'm sure you will ask, because I, I'm sure they gave you a little note. They didn't, they didn't give you the note. Okay, because Kaichur News does that. Everyone, I'm, every one of those, the land issues, we went to a public tender for the expression of interest. There were two, there were two companies that did not get the land on the East Bank because what the government did it went out to a public tender for expressions of interest for developers. It came to the cabinet. There was a decision to say to give everybody an allocation, all of those who tendered. The only two groups that did not get land were Eddie Boyer because he had won a bid, a public tender for the land at Lelendal. And secondly, Tulsi Pasad, because Tulsi Pasad said he wanted the land for free, didn't want to pay. That was the report that came to the cabinet. Everyone else, 
paid the same rate, and they all, every person who expressed an interest got an allocation. I notice they're only mentioning one person, but why don't they mention some of them who are close to the government now? You have about 10 persons who got allocations of land on the East Bank as developers. Now, what the government needs to do is to see if they have met the conditions now, because there are conditions attached to those contracts. They have to put in a, a given number of infrastructure. They have, to, um, they have to do it within a certain time frame. The sale of the, they have to build houses, etc. So the government can e explore whether they have complied. Yes. So they have to explore that, whether they have complied. But why single out a single one, like Ekaichor is doing? Why single out a single one? And when it came, you're talking about transparency. It was out of a public tender for expressions of interest. Didn't happen like the hospital or this, the calling in, the, the negotiation of the power purchase deal, etc. So that's, 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 I knew you would come to that one, so I just answered it before you did. Um, I, they, clearly the person who molested the child is reprehensible and he should face the full force of the law and all the parties in this country every single party should distance themselves from him to send a signal that we will not be soft on child molesters or any person of that or who commit offenses against children. I was president when we decided to strengthen the laws um, governing you know, children and their welfare and, and women. We passed the, an act against vi uh, violence against women and children we strengthen the laws um, governing welfare of children. We establish the Child Care Protection Agency. I think the minister, um, I'm not sure if she was fully aware of all the facts. Yes, she was. She was? Because I don't want to be unfair to Valde Lawrence too, um, because sometimes in their portfolio, people um, do not, do not, um, they don't have all the facts at their disposal. But if she knew of the facts, um, if she knew of the facts, and she made that comment, I think then she clearly has abdicated her responsibility to the child. She chose a political person um, in front of a child, and she has not just ordinary responsibility, but a statutory responsibility, political responsibility, administrative responsibility for that ministry to protect the, and, to, and to protect the interests of the ch child. Whether she should resign or not, I think this is a matter for the president. I am not, I'm not one who willy-nilly call for the resignation of ministers. Uh, if she has expressed contrition, said I was wrong, I'm sorry about it, those comments were unfortunate, and I commit to have a full investigation of this matter, and I'm gonna, we are going to bring the full force of the law down on this person's head, then I think she should be allowed to do so.
I've never seen that newspaper, so I, I can't comment on anything, but I'm worried about, and I'm sure, well, not Kaichur News, I'm not, it's not personal, but Kaichur News will not be worried about this, but most people in Guyana will be worried about the abuse of these so-called audits. That they were done in a political fashion, and they're being used not to pursue legal cases, because that's what should happen. The audits, if they find irregularities, if they find corruption, then those audits should be used to support cases against individuals who they find corrupt. When I listen to Minister Jordan in Parliament speak about the audits that have been completed, his tone was, we have found a lot of procedural errors, etc. Now, in the meantime, these audits are not being used for that purpose, or they're taking a very long time using it for that purpose, but they are being made public selectively without the right of response from other people, the individuals who are affected. I know some of the audits are so, so unprofessional that they will not withstand not just a court of, of, of law, but an ordinary person just assessing it and saying that it's more a political document. So what they're doing now, I believe they're in the process of damaging repetitions. So they're giving their supporters, who, because all of these big claims of corruption, want to give their supporters some red meat. And the, the conduit is the Kaichor News. The conduit is the Kaichor News for red meat for their supporters. So it's destroying repetitions of many, many people. The, I know Mahendra Sharma, a young, bright professional. Young, bright professional. Look at the assault on this young person. A professional. Second, Winston Brassington. Professional uh, assault again damaging their reputations because I suspect Winston Brassington went after Guyana stores that the owner of Kaichor News didn't pay for. They talk about all these privatizations that were not paid for and they forget to mention Guyana stores that the owner of Kaichor News is sitting on the board. They didn't have an AGM for 10 years over 10 years, and they, they have not paid the government, we had to sue them, go to court, and the matter is in court now. You never hear about that. And recently, by the way, we paid the taxes for Ghana stores, the taxpayers of this country. Was it a payoff? It must have been a payoff by the government for what Kaichor News, the help that Kaichor News is giving them. So, so this is what is happening every single day. It destroying people's reputation based on some audits that are, even when the audits are professional, they handpick certain sections and take them out of context. So that is, my, that is my view about audits. So if you have these audits and they point to corruption, you know what happens. The next step is hand the audits over to the police, have the police investigate the matter, not have SOKU, which now falls on the office of the president. Now we were surprised to hear that, because it used to be under the police, go after people, but have a professional uh, investigation. If people stole any money, charge them, put them before the court. That's how you operate. I heard the, these were forensic audits. Forensic audits are done with the purpose of prosecution, not for Kaichur news, <laughs> you know, as fodder for Kaichur news and political fodder. It's all, it's all 
fake. This is the last remaining straw of this government, the only plank that it can say anything about. It's already destroyed the plank that they will do better on security matters because people now know that this country is seen increase in crime since they took office. Used to champion that a lot, saying with all the security people it had, could do better. That they would have, do better on the economy. They had a long list of people waiting to come and invest in Guyana. None has come so far. Economy is in shambles. That they will bring greater benefits to people. They took away from the pensioners. They took away from almost every conservative group. 1.6 billion from our homes through the 10,000 grants, and they're spending 500 million to clean up the country and expect us to be grateful for this. You know, you took 1.6 billion from us and you spent 500 million to clean up, and you took 1.6 billion from the kids, and we must be grateful for that. So they've destroyed that plan too. On the, the, what else are they going to campaign? that they campaigned on, that transparency issue has gone out the window. Very few public tenders, government spending, took it, the youth salary increases for themselves, all of these private deals with their supporters, um, that has gone out the window. The only thing they're hanging on to is that the PPP was corrupt and they're, they're finding it hard to prove even that. And now, what, what, what they're doing. They're just, it's propaganda. So that's the last remaining plank for this government. Long before the next elections are, 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 become due, people would recognize the true nature of this government. APNU supporters as well as PPP supporters because we are opposition for the country, not for PPP areas alone. We, I've made it clear our support comes from PPP, um, you know, strongholds, a lot of it, but the causes that we champion will not be only PPP supporters' causes. That if there is a problem in Linden where people r run afoul of this government and the government tries to infringe on their rights, we'll stand by their side too, and any other part of the country. It's not, we are not opposition for, for PPP supporters alone. Thank you. You mentioned the difference in philosophies as it relates to um, development. Government um, recently said that they're expecting an economic boom for the um, independence um, celebration. So economic boom for the independence? Yeah. Well, it is. It is just. I don't know how to characterize this. It's the boom around the celebrations. But this is not private money. This is state's money. So you're taking a billion dollars to celebrate independence, 1.2 billion in the budget for dietary. That's 2.2 billion. You can't keep wheels open by spending 1.7 billion dollars. You can't help the rice farmers, which brought in 250 million US dollars in 2014 that was spent in this economy by spending $500 million, but you can spend $2.2 billion on that. What happens after the money is gone? Okay, so the hotels get a little bit more in that period. So you get, a, you know, some people in the hotels, you have some increased spending in the economy for that period. What happened? Why did they shut down our mushroom money? If that is so, you want to stimulate the economy around certain national events, why did they shut down our Mashramani? We deliberately did something. I, I said when I was president, let us look at Mashramani, that period, um, celebration of our Republican Mashramani, August and December, around Christmas time. And any, we, any person who comes in, brings in artists and all of those things, they'll get a special tax concession from the government for that in those three periods, because we wanted people to come ho home, we wanted them to spend, we wanted the private developers to be able to, you know, make money, the promoters, etc., so they didn't have to pay a large amount of taxes, and that, that helped a lot. If that's the case, it's not, a, but it's, you have to fix 
the underlying fundamentals of the economy. And Jordan said three things, basically. He said, in his analysis, one is that there are soft commodity prices globally, and it would affect us. Two, that the U.S. is ending TARP, and therefore TARP is this special program that they had to help, and which led to this quantitative easing, the central banks buying bonds, etc., in making money cheaper. The money supply grew significantly so to, to help to stimulate economic growth after the 2007-2008 financial crisis. So they're ending that, so interest rates will rise. He said that that may affect us. And then he spoke about deflation in the economy last year. So those are the three big things, external factors. That's why I said in the budget, where are the measures to address each of these measures to ring fence our economy from those effects? The first should have been one that we allow looser money because then that fights deflation, that we have an increase in money supply. Um, secondly, and, and there, there are fiscal measures you can use for that to happen too, but I'm just talking from a monetary perspective. Secondly, if, if commodity prices are low and we have to compete globally with people who maybe have lower cost of production, what do you do? You don't do in a $230 billion budget not give any help to the productive sector. You focus on increased productivity of those sectors and secondly, cutting their cost of production so then they can become a bit, a bit more globally competitive so that they can compete even with the low prices to maintain economic activities. And then on the interest rate side, we can, we can probably insulate. We, we don't have to worry about that too much because many of our people don't borrow commercially abroad. We don't have major ex or significant national exposure. But those are the things that you need to address. The economic fundamentals, the threats to the economy. Not talk about, you know, well, we can celebrate the independence and we'll have an economic boom. How, how does that translate into an economic boom? Excepting for that period when people come here, there'd be a little bit more money circulating in the economy. But if you're taking the money away from people through higher taxes, 140 items nearly, they have to pay higher taxes, or you're taking more money away from them because now to renew their licenses for, tra for trade and for economic activities, they have to show they pay taxes for the past seven years. So you're going to, many people will go underground, you'll take a little bit more from them. You, now people have to pay more for tires, etc. How come, how are they going to, you're going to increase disposable income? And, and spending. In fact, the state will be collecting more from people. No, it's not going to be in circulation. And if that happens, and it is happening, that's why we see sloth in the entire country. I, I went to Corriveton Market and, and Port Morant, and Comarca, and in Bartica, and I went to Pomona area, and the whole Essequibo coast, past the Anna Regina place and the markets here are passed through New Amsterdam. Every single person, almost every single vendor complains. And these are not PPP people alone. Everyone complains. But the ministers sail through in their new fleets of vehicles and their long lines of cars, etc. And, and it seems as though they never stop there to talk to people. Because they have this concept of the good life in the green economy. And we're getting neither. And so this is pure nonsense. It's pure nonsense that you can drive an economic boom by celebrating independence. If that's the case, every country will be celebrating every day. It's nonsense.